Welcome, welcome, welcome. And well, to start the conversation, uh, I would like us for you to tell us uh, the best thing about Toy Story 4. I mean, why did you like the film so much? How much of your soul you put into it? Um, which one is your favorite character? I mean, whatever you can tell us about this film. Um, well, the, the I was I started on hi everybody. I started on this film um, at, when I was finishing on Inside Out, and it was so I started in May of 2014. So it's been about five years, and uh, being asked to, to direct a Toy Story movie is the most terrifying thing that could ever happen, and also the most exciting thing because I love these characters and I love the world so much and. It's ex always exciting to bring new characters to the, to the, to the Toy Story movies, and uh, working with the cast is amazing. So it's it's been a it's been a, a tough one, but really rewarding at the same time. Yeah, I'll, I'll just add. First of all, can can I say this is the most beautiful place we've ever been? This thank you for having us here. We just we want to sit here all night <laughs> and talk about things. But uh, I'll, I'll just add. Uh, the crew on Toy Story 4, you asked you know, how much of our soul do we put into it. I would say everything. One thing about this movie, and it's true of all the films we've worked on, is that we don't make anything unless we, unless we love it. We, you know, we hope the audience loves every, every film and that it does business and, and so forth, but we start with just making what we want to make and what we want to see. And so this film, has a, it's an interesting crew because it's, I worked on the first one a little bit. I was an intern and a production assistant on the first Toy Story film. And there's a number of us on, that, on, on the crew that worked on the original, our production designer and some of the technical folks. And then there's a number of people that are working on the film or worked on the film that were six years old when the first one came out. And they had to say it was the first movie they ever saw. And so there's this group dynamic there that, you know, the, kind of the old timers like myself, we say like, we don't want to mess this up for Pixar because we love Buzz and Woody so much. And then there's a, a group of younger people that, that are saying like, don't mess up our childhood because we grew up with Buzz no and Woody. No pressure at all. No pressure. And that, that was, it was legit and real pressure because none of us, we just want to honor it because we love Toy Story so much. And, and when we kind of found this w way to get into the story, which we really got excited about it. I felt like, oh, maybe, maybe we can do that. So that was kind of its origin and how we, we feel about it. So when it's, now that it's out, we feel really proud of it. And uh, every single frame of it is made by hand with love from, from the, the crew at Pixar. Yeah, we, we told ourselves we weren't going to make something unless, we, unless it earned the title of Toy Story 4. So that was a high bar. Yeah. Very high. And what about the character? Which one is your favorite character or the character that you fell in love with? In a way, in a way, it's like asking who, which is your favorite child. <laughs> Only because and, and this may sound cheesy, but every day we go into work and we are with Woody and Buzz and, and Bo and, and all these characters, and we we see them more than our own children, kind of, you know, eight hours a day. So we're always thinking about them as as real people and and have, having real emotion, and they come across. We treat, they after a while. The movie starts to tell you what it needs to be, and it's almost like the characters are telling you what they what they need to go through. Which I know it sounds very bizarre, but it, it feels that way. And so to say which one which one of your children do you love the most, um, it's, a, it's a tough it's a tough one. Oh, but I do yes, but I do think that the, you know Woody Green the protagonist. He's probably my favorite just because he's um, I relate to him as a as a as a director, but also as a father, like we always treat the, the toys as parents. That, that their job is to be there for their kid, and that is the most important thing for them. And they take it very seriously. And whenever something threatens that, is when they get anxious or scared or fearful. And that is real uh, parent emotion. And so I always, uh, even before I had kids, I was like, there's, I was attached to what he was about. You guys haven't seen it yet. There's there's a lot of new characters, um, but I think my one. I just like Woody. It's it's true. It's hard to call. I think Jesse has has over the years is my favorite character, and it's and it's because Jesse in in Toy Story Two. It, it, that's kind of the first time that um, a character exposes Woody a little bit that he's privileged and that he's 
kind of got everything he's ever wanted and that most toys haven't. And Jesse's the first one to shine that light on Woody. And it's, I think in a, in a weird way, that moment in Toy Story 2 is, is a really good setup for what we were doing in 4. So I've just, I've always thought of Jesse as the character that kind of unlocked the real story a little bit. That's my, that's my take. So I just love her. Oh, wonderful. Um, one question, not about Toy Story, but about your personal lives. I mean, uh -oh. No, 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 this, this, <laughs> this uh, I mean, here in the audience we have young students, young professionals. I mean, now you've you know, walked the path you know, a long way in this industry and you're directing this amazing property. I mean, what word of advice would you give these guys? Wow, yeah. I I gotta be honest, on, on the whole tour we're on right now, this is, I was most excited about this, because um, when I was in art school, I had a lot of uh, people come and talk, and that really inspired me, so I'm hoping that this will do the same for you as, as well. Um, the one thing that I continue to learn uh, through school and through work in, is just that uh, we're communicating ideas, like wh whether you're in um, video games or animation or film, whatever it is, you're just trying to communicate ideas across. The best way to, that you can communicate, the clearest way to, to communicate is the best. So whether that's drawing or uh, whatever it is you need to, to do to do that. It, it, for me anyway, it was drawing because I went to, went to school for illustration. So my advice is always carry a sketchbook, draw from life nonstop all the time. Um, it helps regardless of, what, of where you go in life and what you do. Drawing is a great way to communicate. You don't need words to do that. Um, let's see what else. The, uh, do you have any thoughts on this? Yeah, I, I've thought about this a lot because I came into Pixar as an intern right from film school in, in San Francisco State, and it was before Pixar was known. It was it was the 1994. It was the last year Toy Story was in production, and I didn't know what Toy Story was. Pixar had done some short films and some commercials in those days, and uh, I I'm not an artist. I always wanted to be an artist or a, a, an animator. Um, but I, I, don't, I don't have those skills, but I love film. I love making things and being part of a team. And um, I had my heart set on, I wanted to work for Disney. I wanted to work for either the parks or in, in Disney animation. And I was kind of lock stuck on, that was, that was my goal. And my one piece of advice is be open to where, where you, what you think your goal is in terms of where you go is different. Because what I found with Pixar by pure accident, and it was literally that I called them, uh, because I heard that they needed help. Someone in San Francisco State was saying they were busy, but I didn't know on what. And um, I walked in to, to, to start work because they needed help, and I found, at the time what I thought was, uh, and I still describe it this way, it was like a cooler punk rock version of how I pictured Disney to be. And I realized in a weird way, had I aimed at that one target, I would have missed a little bit because I found a, I don't know, like this strange version of it that I didn't even know exists. So I only share that because there may be, and listen, I love Pixar. I hope everyone aims for something like Pixar, but I promise you there are probably five or six Pixar, like punk rock versions of that brewing somewhere. So just don't don't be afraid to, to look under every rock and look at places you, you don't think because it's, it's all about the future. It's all about what people are thinking of next. So anyway, that's, that was kind of my perspective on it. Thank you. Oh, one last question from me before we open it to the audience. And this has to, to do with storytelling. I mean, we, I mean, we live in a society where stories are the, the element that connect us and, and can actually propel human beings to become better beings. Um, what do you think you put that in your movies? I mean, how are your movies making better human beings? Well, we, we never... We never begin with that. Like trying, we never try to sit down and go, how can we make the world a better place? <laughs> I think we, what we do is we just we try and tell stories that have a truth behind them. Whether that's, um, you know, I'm thinking like, oh, he said, man, I just sometimes feel like I just want to get away from everything. You know, that, that's something, like, man, I feel that way too. And um, inside out, we all think we have got, you hear voices in our head. So it's just, that was always something that is a, a, a truth to just being human. And I think, um, you know, the, all of us have our own story, and the thing I've noticed over time is that the more personal your story is, the more universal it is. Um, Coco being a fantastic example of that, like 
shot. I think everybody was surprised at how well it, around the world it was received. So um, I think just just finding a, a truth in the world that's human, and that I think that's within yourself, so finding your own story and seeing what moves you, because it's going to move somebody else as well. Thank you. Want to add anything to that? No, I remember. Oh, only, yeah, I will add to that, just because uh, you, you mentioned Up, and, and we both worked with, with Pete Doctor for, for many years on many films, and one of Pete's mentors was a, was a guy named Joe Grant. And Joe Grant, among other things, was a, a character designer and story artist at Disney in the 1930s. He, he, um, he helped design the Seven Dwarfs. He wrote Dumbo. Um, with a, with a guy named Dick Humor, and we got to meet Joe. He, he, we dedicated the film up to him because he was a lot like Carl Fredrickson in that film. He was this, he died drawing at his table. He was an artist all the way till the end. He was an amazing artist and writer. And he, I just remember him saying, um, talking to us about films, and he said, you know, you always want to give something to let the audience take away with them, so that it's not just a fleeting experience, but it's something that it's almost like a vacation that you want a, a, a souvenir from. And he said, that's why Dumbo still is relevant, because that's just a movie that's about something very simple. It's about a, it's basically about a guy with a handicap who has to overcome an obstacle. And it's very simple, and you feel for him. And you know, whatever, 80 years later, people still talk about it. We talk about it every day, a very simple story. And it just really resonated. And it's something that, again, we don't set up and say, OK, we're going to make a film that's important. We say we want to make a film that's good and entertaining. But if you do it from a I don't know, an emotional, personal, connective place, you will, you will end up making something that hopefully resonates with people. So we think a lot, of, a lot about that stuff, the pathos of it all, juxtaposed with the comedy and the entertainment and so forth. Thank you. Thank you. Great answer. So um, who has the microphone question? I see a hat back there. There, go. there it is. Hello. And you're the um, Yeah, nice to meet you. Nice to see you again. Uh, uh, but, uh, Thank you. Sure to meet you. Jonas. Nice to meet you. Thank you. Uh, do, do you speak Spanish? Or? No. So sorry. Oh. No. Well, uh, it's because your name is something. Northern California, Mexican American. So sad. <laughs> well, uh, of no, course, of course. Well, I have a couple of questions. Uh, first, um, and when it comes to the animation field, uh, here is the, what is your, well, for all of you, one, your three of you, what are your favorite animation techniques um, that includes the CGI and it's, is it, and it's also about the uh, 2D and stop motion, but also the puppetry. Um, what are your favorite mediums in, in the animation medium? You know, in one of the four. You, you know, um, I don't have a favorite. I think the um, the story kind of drives what that medium is. Like, for example, I can't imagine seeing uh, Nightmare Before Christmas uh, in 3D. It just wouldn't, it wouldn't feel right to me. It just be, the way that stop motion, like it, it adds to the charm of that story. And uh, I think it's fascinating to see how the stories that people tell are kind of move towards the, the uh, medium as well. So I don't, uh, to answer your question, I don't have a favorite one. I think uh, it, it depends on the story. I have to admit there's, you know, working at Pixar, obviously we're computer animators and, and I love the look and the rendering and the things we can do. But I have to admit, whenever I see hand-drawn animation, I sit up a little more. There's something about the, the, the pencil line and the, and the, and the you know, I'm a sort of a, I, I love the, the classic Disney animated films, those are, my, those are my favorites, but I just love, I just love that look. I mean, if anything, we, we do a lot of work trying to maintain that spirit in CG animation. So we have a question in the mic. So you, you mentioned that, well, uh, you've been at Pixar for a long time, and you talked about the punk rock thing going on when, when you started. How did the punk rock spirit kept going or was phased out with the growing of the company? Or is it alive today? Or, or losing that punk rock is part of, of a 
growing pain and just like how how has it changed and how does that how do you manage to for that change to not affect the spirit of what a Pixar movie is? Fantastic question. Go for it. Well <laughs> Yeah listen I'd be lying if I if I said Pixar hasn't changed. It's changed since nineteen ninety five. It's bigger, there's more of us, there's more pressure on these films to perform around the world and so forth. But yet, and in those days, you have to understand it was like Steve Jobs was there roaming the halls. I mean, he literally was the think different, was his, his motto. And so everything was about let's go the other way. If people are doing this, let's do that. And that's part of the DNA. As we've gotten bigger, that's evolved and changed. But I'd say. I still feel it. I still feel it too. Yeah. I mean, it, just as an example, we made a character out of a spork. Like, uh, we have the most advanced computers in the world, and we made a spork. Yeah. So, we, in a way, we try and be a little, you know, punk rock in our storytelling as well, just to, to go the opposite way. I mean, just the fact that we made a fourth one is kind of punk rock, because people were like, wait, what? I thought you were done. Yeah. So, I think there is something to, the, the spirit is definitely still there. There's a fight to it. People, we, we screen our movies, by the way, internally for, most people at the studio, and I found it very interesting, as we've kind of grown up and have a lot of tenure and been there a long time, the younger people that have come in send us notes, they do not hold back. Like, people are not afraid to speak up what they think, and they, they tell us what they think. Yeah, it's great. <laughs> and so, I think that, and sometimes that's rough, but it actually makes me feel good about the future of the place, because people kind of come into it with a lot of guts, and they want to make great things, so, you know, it's, it's a balance, but, it's still part of the company for sure. Hello, good afternoon. Nice, sure. nice to meet you. Thank you. Uh, I just wanted to tell you that today I'm really happy because it's the exactly 10th anniversary of the Academy Award winner of It was released to yeah. May 29th, 2009. That's right. Happy yeah. anniversary. Happy yeah. anniversary. Yeah. Congratulations. And I, I would love to know about the well, and we have seen a series of short like Kim Wood that's going to be on Disney Plus. I, I want to know what is the short that is going to be a prior Toy Story if there's one. And if have you ever thought with Randy Newman, with so many talented musicians, maybe a Pixar musical? Are we allowed to talk about the beginning? Yeah. yeah. Uh, we're not having a we're not having a short for this film. Uh, about that, but yeah, it just it kind of didn't, just didn't, didn't work out with the schedule. Sometimes it winds up, sometimes it doesn't, and so this one we're not. Um, musical? Who, who knows? I mean, actually, Coco originally was going to be a musical, so I think we've, we've, we've played with it before. We've toyed with it, but we've never done it. You're right. It's a, we never say never. There's kind of no rules when anyone's developing a picture, so it could be very well that, that that's something we toy with. Randy Newman would be amazing. Yeah, Randy Newman. Such a treasure to work with on this film too. Yeah, okay. We'll, we'll let you know. <laughs> Sir, I have my question here. What is your creative formula for making films at generations without falling into monotony? Can you repeat your question a little louder? Uh, what is your creative formula for making films that transcend generations without falling into monotony? Good. ourselves and yet tell stories and play the work. Well we have a we have a multitude of voices. I think that helps a lot. We're not just telling them, you know, having the same person tell the same story. Um, but I think also just having characters that um, are different from one another and have to, you know they're all we treat them all as human but they have different traits and different personalities. I think that helps with it. What else? I wonder if the, it's like the brain trust a little bit is, is might be worth mentioning. We have a creative brain, all the directors, producers, writers, and so forth. when we show the movies to each other, we do this a lot, we get all the directors in the room and they'll, hopefully with objectivity, give notes, not about, it's not about competing, it's about just making every film the best. And so, 
I think that it's pretty healthy to have a room with Brad Bird in it that says, I would not do that, and I think you're wrong for that, and Pete Doctor to counter that with this note, and you know, Stephanie Folsom, our writer, to defend it from this way, but then the director to stand up and talk to why he or she's put it in the movie, and that tug of war between, the, between that, those groups usually help the movie yeah. When you're working on it, you can fall in love with the wrong thing. There are things that we think, this is the best part of the movie, and then you show an audience, like, that makes no sense in the movie. <laughs> you're too close to cut out. You're five years of this. So we rely on each other, I think, to help us prevent falling into tropes or repeating each other, but to also to keep it fresh and um, exciting to the audience. You guys were all here for Brad Bird. Was he here last year? He, I remember one of the brain stress sessions we had. It was the first time we had Porky um, in the film. And he was just like, yeah, man, Forky's the movie, man. You gotta keep Forky in the movie, that's it. That's just the movie, it's too much for Forky. He was very excited, so, you know, we're, we're like, great, because we've been creating the character, but it's just to have a fresh voice, somebody who I haven't seen, then have the baggage of creating it, hear what they have to say, and somebody who I respect and trust as a storyteller as well, so it's huge. Three months later, I saw Bird driving out of the parking lot, and he rolled down his window and he goes, Forky! <laughs> As if we were going to forget it. <laughs> He's very loud. <laughs> so, talking about the movie, how would you say uh, all the characters have evolved from the first movie to this last one? I mean, how have, how have they have evolved from how they interact with each other or with new characters? How have, how have they changed? Yeah, great question. So this is something that we were very conscious of from, the, from day one, because you're doing the fourth film. There's a lot of track that's been laid for us. And so we did not want to make sure, we, we wouldn't make sure we did not copy ourselves or do something that didn't feel right for the character. So for example, um, you know, in a way, uh, Forky coming into the room is kind of like Buzz Lightyear coming into the room, but Woody's reaction is completely different. So in Toy Story 1, he's jealous and he gets anxious and he literally wants to murder him. And, like and but when Forky comes into the room, we said we were like, we can't have that same thing happen because this is a Woody who's evolved and is now um, more mature and, and actually and cares. It's not a selfish thing, it's like what's right for Bonnie. So we have him take on uh, Forky as a, as a mentor, as opposed to wanting to get rid of him and kick him out of the room. So we take into it, we take all that into consideration as where he's been and, and kind of where we see him going for all this. Same thing with Bo, just knowing we looked at the um, Toy Story one and two to see her scenes, uh, just to remind ourselves. We watched all of her scenes together. It only took six minutes. She's really not on the screen that much at all. And, but what we noticed is that she's actually one of the strongest characters in the Toy Story room. Because whenever Woody would get frustrated or not know what to do, he would turn to Bo and she'd say, look under your boot, look whose name's there, you know, your kid loves you. And he would go, oh right, kind of remind him of who he was. And so we thought we could, we could just take that character who's already there and just show how, and just bring her up to the surface and make her even stronger. She's gone out and lived a life that Woody's never even dreamt of. So we are taking in consideration one, two, and three into everything, everywhere we're going with four, um, including Buzz's relationship with Woody. Their friendship is more important than ever in this film. So from, from the storyteller point of view, you, you are a storyboard artist. And do to make and remake the storyboard line. And how much a struggle was to make Toy Story 4 in, in this part of making the storyboard? Just the story reels. I wouldn't say there's at least 20 versions of the movie. Yeah, I mean we did it over and over and over and over again. So there's a lot. And and pieces of them would stay. Pieces, of, a lot of them would fall away. You know, when, you're, when you watch a Pixar film, you're watching all the, the best ideas at once. It's like you're, you know, it's reduced down to its purest form, and then you just shoot it here in 88 minutes, and you're done. But it takes us five years to find those little nuggets and those things just to reduce it down. We come up with a lot of bad ideas all the time, uh, and that's why we don't show them to anybody. 
somebody. And, and sometimes, the, but sometimes the bad ideas feel like bad ideas, and then they. I mean, Forky was that. I mean, Forky. We honestly, when you guys started drawing Forky, we literally said, "Is this the worst idea, or is this a good idea?" We didn't know, I and then we started way. turning into a good idea. And you can't now imagine the movie without him. So we just chase everything down. I think that's one of the secrets of Pixar is we just give ourselves the runway that the studio is built to. Ed Catmull used to always say, our job is to be wrong as quickly as we can. And we're good at that. We're good at being wrong Very quick. Good. And then we give ourselves the time to, to shift it and make it better, and make it work. I love Forky. I always thought he was wrong. good. What was the inspiration to make Forky and did you have that kind of issues that the kids create their own toys when you were kids? Yeah? Yeah, yeah so we were sitting around in the story room one day and just joking around like we, like we do. And we asked the same questions that everybody asks, you know, like, why does Buzz, in the first film, he thinks he's a space ranger, so why is he falling down on the floor when a rain comes into the room? So we, we think about all that stuff, and um, so one of the things we were joking with is, well, what if Bonnie picks up a rock and draws a face on it and starts playing with it? Is it, is it alive now? There was just all these, you know, what are the rules of the world? And then we thought about our own kids and how uh, our kids will make arts and crafts projects in school or, you know, for fun and uh, play around with them, or sometimes they'll get Christmas presents and they'll play with the box instead of the actual toy that it came, that it came with it. So all these, like, they're, they're toy truths, and that's always where the gold is in Toy Story, is where you're able to look at something and go, oh, I know what that is, I've done that before, I've seen that. And so we just joked around, well, what if you made a toy and it came to life, what would happen? And having a character that has never seen Toy Story 1, 2, or 3, and all of a sudden comes to life and doesn't understand anything about anything. That to me is just is comedy gold and also just feels fresh and new to the, to the, uh, to the franchise. So um, that's where Forky came from. Do you have a second part of that question? Yeah, about the, the inspiration uh, of Forky. I think it was from that, from our, from our kids. Yeah, I think, I think so. And then I think we just started weaving him into the story so deeply that it was not only was it a fun idea inspired by kids and, and a toy truth, we call it, but a way to really amplify Woody. You know, if, you, if Woody was once replaced by that, by Buzz Lightyear, even Woody would have to go, well, he is Buzz Lightyear. He even says he's got buttons and lasers. And I have to admit, he's pretty cool. Well, now he's replaced by that. I mean, poor Woody is like, I don't know how much more I can take. That felt like we could, we could, we could dramatize that. And especially when the, even that thing doesn't want to be a toy, it thinks he's trash. It's, it's, it's a, the, kind of the worst thing. So that's why I love Woody, because he, he embraces that. He's like, well, if Bonnie loves this, then I'm going to help this toy understand right. what that means. Oh my god, so that means that every art craft that we made is a toy and Absolutely, oh my god. You've, you've killed a lot of toys. Yeah. <laughs> Why? I'm sorry, that's just the way it is. Thank you. Thank you so much. What do we do? Oh, and what do we have there and then there? Uh, hi. Um, hi there. My, person, my, my, my question is kind of personal, and it may be personal for you too, but how did, how did your childhood influence in the creative process of the characters? And of the storyboard and the story of a of each of each character. Mm How -hmm. our childhoods? Yeah, I think in every way. <laughs> yeah. Well, I never grew out of my childhood. That's part of the problem. I think you know, I have I have these in my office and uh, not you know, don't play with them, but I maybe mean, I do. <laughs> you had to buy them. <laughs> yeah. Um, so that helps. Just ha having a a naive sensibility, just coming to things from a naive sense, you know, uh, very, just thinking, thinking like a, the kid's point of view. I don't feel like I'm answering the question. What was the question? I totally lost it. Oh, our child. Well, for one thing, we put toys in this movie that are from our childhood. So, Woody and, and uh, you know, Woody is very 1950s. We grew up in the 
70s, 80s, and so we have a lot of those toys. And there was a huge toy explosion over in history during the, the 70s and 80s with like the Star Wars toys, and um, we've got a, like a Polly Pocket type of toy in there, and, and uh, what else? Duke, Duke, yeah. yeah, Duke, Duke. He's kind of a product of our 70s yeah. youth. And, and carnival toys as well. So we looked at all what we grew up with, and we just used that as inspiration as well. I think too, man, just to go, all the way with it, and this is common at Pixar, because you're right, we, we're we sort of bonded by the fact that all of us are kind of like eight to 10 year olds there, in a way, in the way we think and see the world. And I don't mean that in a, in a mocking way, it's a really how we, like, we see the world, like we're not faking it, like we love this stuff. When I was a kid, my moment, we all have sort of these moments we talk about, and we talked a lot about this on Inside Out, it's like, what is those core memories, that moment that defined you? And when I was a kid, my parents took me to Disneyland when I, was, when I was four years old, and I remember what I was wearing on that day. Like, it hit me like a rock, and um, I didn't, obviously I was four, I didn't know what, what working was, but I knew like I wanted to be part of that. There was something about that moment that, cemented something in me, just wanting to hold on to that. I think all of our films, in a way, have this... Um, your pan. Your pan, like, wanting to hold on to that feeling we had when we were kids. Um, and it's a sophisticated feeling. Again, it's not playing dumb. It's like a real, legitimate thing. I, that trip, I have a map I got of Disneyland from 1974, and it's framed in my office, because every day I come in, I sort of feel like I kind of want to, like... I, I, my job is to try to share that feeling. A little bit, like to somehow take that feeling I had when I was a kid and and help help amplify it out of the world. And that's kind of how I see these pictures. It's like it's our way to do it. Like we don't want anyone to forget how good that felt to be to have that lens. And so I don't know. I think our movies, although we try to make them sophisticated and for adults with adult issues, we want them to be have warmth and fun of the way we all saw the world when we were kids. So it's a deep question and something we think about all the time. Nice to meet you. Uh, my question is, how it was to have in your hands a sequel to the most important movie saga from Pixar? What? <laughs> <laughs> Can you say that again? No, no, I, I heard that, I was joking. How it was to have in your hands a sequel to the most important movie saga or on Pixar? It was a lot of pressure. Um, from a, being handed. Yeah, yeah, the, the pressure. Yeah, so, um, you know, I, I love these characters. I, I got to, you know, I, before I started working at Pixar, I saw Toy Story 1 and 2 as a general audience. So I kind of came into it as a huge fan already. And um, we love these characters so much at Pixar, and they are kind of the, um, foundation of the, our entire company, you know, the first Toy Story being the first animated or CG film, and, um, and they're responsible for that, and so we take great pride in them, and, and, you know, knowing we wanted to continue the story, we just did not want to mess that up at all, so, um, anything more to add? No, it was tremendous pressure, tremendous pressure, and you just hope to honor the legacy of the films, and how much people love them, and we didn't sleep a lot, I'll put it that way. Um, okay. Um, how, well, first of all, I'm gonna make a point here. I think a lot of the audio and the soundtrack of the picture of the movies have stayed with us, and you remember them, and you, you listen to them, and you're like, oh my gosh, wait a minute, I'm going back to my childhood. How do you think the scoring of Toy Story 4 will affect the viewers that have already watched the first three movies or that have not watched any but somehow kind of remind you think there's gonna be a connection there? Oh my god, I can't wait for you to see this film. <laughs> Randy Newman, it, um, he, in my opinion, his music is as important as Woody's voice and, and, and uh, Tom Hanks and Tim Allen. He, he brings, his, his music is Toy Story. So, um, one of the times I lost it, cr started crying, was the very first uh, scoring session when the first cue came up and uh, they're playing to the screen. You know, they've got the screen up there, so I'm watching. And, you know, Buzz and Woody are running around uh, 
Andy's room, and it, music went boom, 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 and I just went, oh. <laughs> and it really hit me. I'm like, this is finally we're making a Toy Story movie. And, and uh, the thing that he did in this film that I thought was just genius was um, he reused themes that of these characters that we are so familiar with, but in a completely different way. And it, it makes it nostalgic, in a, in, which is what you're supposed to be in that moment with Woody, and it also, in a way, like shows you the future as well. And I, I can't explain how he did it, because he's Randy, and, and if you were to ask him, you'd go, I don't know, I just do what I do. <laughs> but you know, he was such a joy to work with. I, I can't speak highly enough about him. Or oh, wherever the mic is. Yes, let's go back. Hi. Hi. I'm Nancy. Well, you just mentioned something about holding on to a very important experience when you were a kid. Yeah. And I was one of those six year olds when Toy Story came out, and holding on to that was even the first reason I even studied animation. Uh, so thank you guys, because that little girl was very happy when she heard that another movie is coming out during my birthday week this year. Oh, happy birthday. <laughs> Uh, but Bless well, your heart. We love you. Thank you. <laughs> uh, now, the question, um, you just mentioned something about trying to make the world a better place, of course, and it's very evident that right now things are very urgent for life, like many, many things going on, etc. And, well, I believe, I am mean, pretty sure you know it, uh, you guys are one of the most powerful people in the world. So whatever you say, it's going to be heard everywhere. So um, how do you, I don't know, like, in terms of trying to set an example to other animation studios and to people in these media that are trying to set up a message, or how are you trying to push any kind of, if, if you are trying to push any kind of agenda here? Uh, I know that all the Pixar movies have a deeper insight in them. I don't know if there's anything in terms of re-educating uh, the population, and uh, I don't know. Thank you for saying that. That's, uh, I didn't realize till right now. Either it's amazing. Um, I just kind of want to percolate in that comment and question. I mean, in terms of other animation studios, or or even at Disney, it's like we don't, and even even internally, it's it's not like we're sitting down trying to make. I I think it would come off false if we tried to sit down and engineer statements or deeper meanings. We always, maybe it comes up, but we always default and go back to to us, to like what we what we feel and what we think is important. Someone asked earlier, like, why do you think the films uh, and not just Coco was did so well, but why do you think all the Pixar films resonate so well with the people in Mexico? It was a good question, and, and I think it's because every time we're in a story meeting on, or in any one of our films, it always comes back to this exercise where we try to strip the plot away and strip the specifics and go, what's the relationships? What do these people care about each other? What are they learning from each other? And I wondered if there's something in the formula, if you will, that there's, it defaults always being about a family dynamic or a relationship dynamic. And there's something, there's something in the cocktail, the simplicity of that, that resonates and helps, I don't know, send the right message, I guess. But, uh, I, I'm not answering your question, I apologize, but it's such a great question. I think I might need a day on it. Yeah, I, I, this is more of a conversation than a, than a q and A. I I did think about this once uh, before, and it freaked me out. Because just the, you know, these stories go everywhere. But um, specifically with this film, the thing that I was hoping that the world takes away is empathy, empathy towards each other, and just seeing that people go through life in different ways, and, and you can't just judge based on what you see, and and that you can connect with people on a different level if you kind of really learn and see who they are. I mean, we did say that at one point. I remember this specifically. We were talking about Woody and how much we love him and his sense of duty. He's a righteous guy. He just wants to do right by his family, basically, by his kids. Kind of, he looks at any of his kids. And I remember that we thought, well, what if, is there a way to scale that? 
I don't know if that was you or Andrew or just in the conversation, like what if, what if there was a way to take that I'm there for my kid and make it plural, make it, you know, I'm there for more. And that would, and then we got to like, wow, what if you could make a movie? And again, not to make a movie that's preachy in any way, but wouldn't it be cool, especially today, if you could walk out of a movie, a 90 minute movie that, that um, has Ducky and Bunny in it, and come out feeling like you wanted to do a little bit more in the world, like maybe help out someone you don't even know. Like, wouldn't that be a cool echo of a piece of art if you could do it? And, um, and we agreed that would be worthy. Now, what, you know, that's not a, that, we're not saying that's what we did, but we are saying that was part of the core thought of like, if you're gonna put something in the world, you better have something to say. And we don't want to abuse that. We want to use that kind of for the right thing. So I don't mean to sound corny or peachy, but it did, it did, it did come up as uh, something, something important to us. Hi. Hi. Uh, first of all, I want to know why did you make Betty like that? I mean, we had a full character with this pink dress and all cute stuff. And now we have something like feminist or something like that. I yeah. don't know. And I want to know why did you do it like that? With with Bo? With, yeah. Yeah. With, with Bo Peep. So the interesting thing is, and I don't think anybody's ever noticed this, is that that's actually her original clothes that she's wearing. And it's just that the petticoat, the pink petticoat is gone and, and, and her bonnet is gone. That's it. She's actually, um, just re, redone her, her, her uh, yeah, the actual dress her, part, you know, her skirt that made it a cloak. skirt that is turned uh, inside out. So you can see the, the pink and duck, the pink polka dots on the inside. That's the actual outside of her, of her uh, skirt. So what we did was we um, just wanted to take Bo and bring her back into the movie, into this world in a way that was totally unexpected to to the audience, but also to Woody. And just so that Woody can kind of be thrown off his game and go, why is she like this? What, what kind of ask, asking the same question you are, which is, what has happened to you? What have you been gone? What have you gone through that, that's made this happen? And um, we were having her return as a lost toy, which is the thing he's been most afraid of for every single movie. And now he's their worldviews are completely against each other. Like he knows he's there for a kid, and she's just like, you don't have to be there for a kid. You're like, no, yes. You know, so there's there's conflict automatically there, and we went through a lot of different variations. Because in the art of book, you'll be able to see there's a ton of different versions that we did with Bo, and we went too far just to see like how crazy can we go with it. We had a version where she looked like um, Furiosa from Mad Max, you know, <laughs> uh, and then we had uh, where her arm was completely missing, and then we had uh, other versions where she was more like camouflaged and so so. We explored a lot. In fact, we had this team uh, we called Team Bo, who was uh, all females made up of, uh, in the studio, made up of animators, artists, uh, lighters, writers, writers, uh, yeah. from every department. And they kind of they kind of called themselves Team Bo and, and get, would gather together and at times even push us out of the room and go, well, we're going to work on this. You guys go do something else. <laughs> and um, they were like Bo's guardian angels, and I love that. Anytime we would be just talking about Bo, somebody would be like, what if we tried this, or what if we tried that? And so we just wanted to bring her back in a, in a big way that was just um, amplifying what was already there in her character. And Annie Potts, who does the voice, is a huge part of that as well. Uh, hi. Hi, how are you? Uh, welcome to Mexico City. Uh, what did you write out by awards to animation injury in Latin America? Yeah, oh, what? Uh, what is your point of five about the animator interest in Latin America? What is your point of view about animation in Latin America? Uh, we love animation. We love animation, period, wherever it's from. To be totally honest, I need to get more uh, involved in seeing what's coming out these days. I haven't had it. We, have, we were joking, we haven't had a chance to see. Any movie, even the, 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 the Disney guys. Like, what'd you think of Aladdin? I've never seen it yet. So, so we, uh, I mean, we're champions of animation 
the, from around the world. It, uh, not just computer, big budget, you know, temple films, but hand-drawn, stop-motion, uh, anything up and coming. We love to we love to dig in and look look into. Yeah, I just like being surprised by by yeah. something I've never seen before. So I'm actually excited to go on vacation after this because I have a stack of movies from here to the ceiling that I need to go watch. Thank you. Have you made any movies? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Pretty good. Yeah. And video games, by the way. Stack of video games. <laughs> hey, uh, uh, I just wanted to ask uh, you, being in the, or working at the most admired studio or animation studio in the world, uh, what is it that you look up to in other studios or big studios in the industry? What do we look up to? Yeah, or what are you looking forward to see? You know what I looked up to recently? Spider Verse is incredible. Yeah, the movie's great. I grew up reading the comic books and reading Spider Ham and all those things. And when I heard they were doing that one with all of them, I thought, oh boy, that's going to be. I, I was blown away at how good the story was and how the techniques and everything. So uh, I admired that greatly. Yeah, me too. We look forward to, I mean, everything. We obviously be in the Disney umbrella. We look forward to seeing the movies that come out of feature Disney animation because oftentimes they'll be doing things that uh, will inspire what we do. And there's a number of examples of that over the years. But I don't know. I'm looking, for, I'm looking forward to the Tarantino movie, personally. I'm just so excited about that. I love his films. That's like one of the great trailers I've ever seen. Um, I don't know. So many. We're just movie fans. We look forward to, to, to seeing everything. We have screenings at Pixar almost twice a week of every kind of film you can imagine, and um, we love it all. We're going to have three more questions, so who's next? Uh, is there hey there. My name is Fernando. Hey, Fernando. Uh, so my question is, uh, in terms of technology, what was the most challenging uh, thing about Toy Story 4? Okay. Yeah, uh, the technology, as you can imagine, is always changing. And 1995 was a long time ago. And so I think the biggest challenge was being open to the new rendering and techniques and stuff we can do with CG, but, but somehow honor the original look of the film. So we boiled it down to three things. And our production designer, Bob Polly, was the character designer uh, on, on the first film. And he helped us kind of cement this, which is no matter what you do with Toy Story, the detail and the, and the complexity of it, it's three things. It's caricatured shapes. So when you model a table, it's not exactly razor sharp precise. It's a certain roundness to it. It's realistic texture. So if you were to use this chair or our denim, it would be kind of amplified. You can see it even on bow, like we really accentuate the textures. And then the theatrical lighting. So it's not just realistic lighting, it is fake and theatrical and somewhat punched up. And so those three things are consistent. Um, on top of that, we have the renderer and the lighting capability. So when you see the film, it opens up in a rainstorm. And that's something we could have never done in Toy Story. I remember there's one shot in Toy Story where the, the rain hits the, the window in the first Toy Story, and that had to be this complete weird shader fake that 15 people had to work on, including Tom Porter, just to make that work. And now we set a whole scene in the rain with rushing water and mud and so forth. And so we're able to do things story-wise that you weren't able to do in 1995. And we just basically use it to amplify the stakes of being a toy out in the world. So it was just maintaining the look, but getting, a, I would also say we get a little closer to the characters, a little closer yeah. to where we shot the film in 239, aspect ratio as opposed to 185, which all the other Toy Stories are. So we wanted a little bit more of a sense of cinema to it as well. Also, specifically for this movie, the, um, the antique store that we do oh, okay. Has, um, it has 10,000 items in it that all had to be set dressed and everything. And at first we didn't know if we could actually do it just because it's so much stuff. We did, so we did a couple tests early on and we were able to do it. We, had, we shrunk the, the store down a little bit just to make it easier, but um, it still has 10,000 items. And so that was a big one and all those items are shaded and, and, and everything. And in fact, any, any shot during the antique store when you're in there, if you hit pause, you're gonna see an Easter egg from some other Pixar film because there's more Easter eggs in this movie than, than any than any fix of the film. All hidden in the shelves. I think the next question is someone here. Hey there. Hey. Hey. Um, I have two different questions. 
questions, one for you, Sa Director and Mr. Producer. The first one, um, when Dana asked me what's my, my favorite movie, I'd say Toy Story, but I think it's twice. And it's not because it's a movie that I saw growing up, it's because it's a movie that embodies everything I am as a person and what type of person what I want to be. So my question is how you create a movie that inspires and you know engage new generation that is knowing these characters for the first time. But most important to engage and inspire guys like me or like everyone in this room that are so inspired and moved by the first one. And there was more as a producer, uh, you mentioned this thing of the voting team. But I'd like to know what else does woman did in Toy Story 4? What, what other, say that last part again, I'm sorry. Uh, how much of importance or develop women have in Toy Story 4? Great, okay. Thank you. And I forgot the first question. It was, uh, <laughs> oh, next part, yeah. So, um, it's a great question. The, the, so we went, we set out to make Toy Story 4 its, its own film, but also part of the greater one, which is a hard thing to do. So that um, my kids, if they hadn't seen the first three, could, would still enjoy this film and see the, and make them actually want to go and see the other ones. And for, for all of you who have seen the other all three, this is a continuation of that story. So we've always treated, I'll tell you this, we've always treated Woody as a, as a parent. And in a way, the end of Toy Story 3 is, is letting the, the parent letting the child go and, and kind of letting them go off into, onto their own. And um, Toy Story 4 is, is, is a little bit of an, an empty, empty nest syndrome, which is the, uh, you know, the child's gone and now, now what am I supposed to do as a parent? So there's a little bit of like trying to figure out your purpose as well, which I think can resonate for everybody, not just for uh, empty nesters, but also children as well, trying to figure out what, what their purpose in life is. And, and to the second question about kind of the, the, the role of the women at the studio, specifically on this film, um, I mean, I can't, I can't state it strong enough. Listen, at the end of the day, what we want to do is we want to make movies that reflect the world we're in, right? We want to make movies that feel real. We do a ton of research, whether they're toys or cars or, you know, or, or whatever, whatever the subject is. But they're all characters, and they're all kind of based on people. And so it's not only kind of Team Bo, who, which was a, a, an organic kind of group of people that wanted to make her feel authentic. It was, it's the fact that, that uh, um, I mean, things, things are changing. The story rooms, the animation dailies at Pixar looks a lot different than it did in 1995. I'm, I'm, I'm proud of all the films and all the work we've done, but the, 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 the business is just changing. People coming out of schools are changing. It's a lot more balanced, and we're starting to see that now at, at Pixar. I mean, two of the directing animators on the film were women, uh, writer, head of story, and uh, they would just, they would just call us on stuff, and to be totally honest, more so than I remember on past films. I mean, just to be blunt about it, when there would be certain ideas we'd have with Bo, and you know, one of those women would say, yeah guys, that's something that a guy thinks a girl would do. We're like, all right, fair enough, I'm a dude. And then they would kind of come in and augur it and recraft it. I mean, that would happen a number of times, and you started to realize, oh, what's happening is it's, at least I think, and I hope you guys feel this when you see it, that the result of that was just a character that was a little more real and nuanced and not falling into any tropes and things. And, and um, I went a long way to go and there's still work to do, but we're, she's sort of a, she's a little bit of the face of that for us when I kind of blur my eyes and look across Pixar. We've worked on a lot of films with a lot of great female characters and supervisors and collaborators, but I would say this is the one that, that we were able to, to dig the, the deepest on. So it's something we're proud of, it's something we're gonna keep working at, and uh, I hope you'll see that. As, a, as part of the DNA of the studio going forward. And the last question. Hey there. Hi. Um, I, I love Toy Story. I love these characters. I, I mean, I, I grew up watching the movies. But I think I would also like to watch um, new stories. Uh, I mean, I know there's something um, new about these characters. They, they have something new to tell us about, but I mean, why did you decide to make a new Toy Story movie and not, you know, like a new franchise? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, fair Great question. question. Yeah. Well, the good news is the next seven films we're making are all original films. You're in luck. So <laughs> you've got watching to do. Um, you know, with with uh, if, if actually I was going to say if this happened, but it did happen when they came to us and said we want to make a Toy Story four. Uh, we said we, we thought it was over. We thought that was the end. We had the same reaction everybody has, and and uh, but we decided or we discovered anyway that what he saying goodbye to Andy concludes his story with Andy, but we uncovered more story for Woody, like we can still complete his arc. And so uh, now that he's in a new bedroom with the, you know, new toys and new kid and everything, um, it's not gonna be the same as, with, as it was with uh, Andy. Bonnie's gonna just a different kid and, and she's gonna play with him differently and that's, that's, how, that's how life is. So, that's what got me really interested in it because I said I've never I know Woody so well, but I've never seen him in that situation. And once we started going down that path, and also knowing we could bring back Bo Peep and kind of answer what happened to her and see how she's affected could, can affect Woody's life again, um, we kind of we uncovered a story that we decided this this is worthy of, of Toy Story Four. And to be honest, that's kind of how we make all of our stories at Pixar. It's like we'll just start talking about it and see what kind of gets uncovered along the way. Yeah, so for what it's worth, we feel the same, and we, we, we put it to ourselves, it's like, well, that's how we feel, we always want to see, we never want to repeat ourselves, so we almost took this like a, as big of a challenge as up or inside out, whereas that had the benefit of, well, no one's seen anything, so we get to kind of present that to the world in a way that no one has any expectation. This everyone has an expectation for, but what if we could just, for the sake of argument, dismiss it? and make a movie we would want to see. That was our challenge. And well, honestly, man, it won me over. We started feeling that. Because um, we did, we told the crew, we told our bosses, like, we're not going to do it if we don't find that, that lane to do it. And so I actually get really excited when you're like, why are you making this movie? I'm like, yeah, <laughs> go find out. <laughs> thank you. Okay, well, thank you, Google. thank you so much. Thank you very much, guys. Oh, thank, thank you, you very much. so much for your passion and basically for your loveliness. Thank you very much.